of his experience is the Iran-Contra war. Something that showed us the lies of the American war on drugs and the American war on terror. So we're going to talk to him about that as well as his personal experiences and get some words of advice because this is a man who has turned his life around and did it under very difficult circumstances. I'm looking forward to talking to him. Again, we have a story that's up on Infowars.com uh, and linked on the Drudge Report. DHS-funded spy tag knows when you visit the bathroom. They know everything about you. And you know what? These guys like to pretend that they're Santa Claus. They know when you're sleeping. They know when you're awake. But And they've got all these wonderful gifts for us. But, you know, I just don't think it's going to work out that way. I've got my suspicions. I guess that just makes me a conspiracy theorist. No, actually, I'm a skeptic of a government that demands to know everything about you, that wants to track you even when you go to the bathroom, but will not tell you anything about itself. Passes laws in secret, passes trade agreements in secret, has court trials in secret, and openly violates all of our guaranteed rights under the Constitution, our God-given rights that are recognized under the Constitution. And now, this tyranny that we have seen on display in America, that has paraded itself now openly without anything happening to it, even after the Snowden leaks, uh, far after the leaks by William Binney and other NSA whistleblowers, now this is metastasizing to other countries. Yesterday, we learned the French Parliament approved new surveillance rules. They say the law on intelligence gathering, this is the BBC reporting, adopted by 438 votes to 86 was drafted after three days of attacks in Paris. Now, what are they giving them the rights to do? This sounds very familiar if, you're, if you uh, know about the American uh, police state, the surveillance state. They're going to define purposes for which secret intelligence gathering may be used. They're going to set up a supervisory body, the National Commission for Control of Intelligence Techniques, with wider rules of operations. Does that sound all familiar? You know, they did all of that. They called it the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. They did that after Frank Church's committee pointed out how our government was spying on American citizens, getting dangerously outside of their mission, turning themselves against the American. They weren't going to protect us against foreign dangers. Remember? Remember what Madison said? Those things that we do to protect us from foreign dangers become instruments of tyranny at home, like the CIA, like a standing army. This is what eventually happens. And so we've seen this all before. We've been there. As a matter of fact, earlier this week, they had uh, statues of Snowden, Assange, and uh, Manning unveiled in East Berlin, Alexander uh, Platz. It's the biggest square in East Berlin. It's very famous in East Germany, the home of the Stasi, the home of the police state that everybody refers to, the police state that William Binney watched for decades. And now William Binney says, we're not this close to a police state, it's already here. See, America has become the poster child now, not East Germany, but now it has become America. We have taken on the mantle of the police state, the surveillance state. So now you've got people that the American government is after for being whistleblowers, people like Manning, Assange, Snowden, the people who exposed criminal actions, who exposed wrongdoings, they're the ones who go to jail. We just saw this this week in the UN, went after uh, a man who was part of a human rights commission, talking about how UN troops were molesting children. Interestingly enough, his name was Compass. I guess they don't have a moral compass, and neither does America. As I said, they're erecting statues to remind people of the heroes that the American government has prosecuted. But don't worry, Jade Helm is nothing to worry about. That military exercise in your backyard, don't worry about it. We'll be right back with Freeway Ricky Ross. Messenger, and of course, uh, Rick Ross uh, features prominently in that. Uh, he's recognized by many people as being a pawn in the CIA drug wars. And of course, if you look at the Iran-Contra uh, scandal, as we pointed out, it involves elements of both the war on terror 
being uh, supposedly helping Iran for money to go after other guerrillas in other parts of the world, as well as the war on drugs. They're running both sides of this. They're running the war on terror. They're funding the terrorists. They're funding the drug organizations, the, the growing of the poppies in um, Afghanistan, and, of course, uh, the cocaine that's coming from South and Central America. And uh, with us today is Exhibit A, and this is uh, Freeway Rick Ross. And of course, uh, we sell his book here at InfoWarsStore.com. It is a bestseller on Amazon, and you can read about this. It's called uh, uh, The Untold Autobiography of Freeway Rick Ross. And again, as I said, you can get that here at InfoWars.com or at Amazon. It's a, a, a top seller. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Now, we've seen a lot of uh, back and forth uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks, of course, about Baltimore. We've yes. seen... Um, Al Sharpton come in and say, well, you know, we need to federalize the police. It's like the, the police. <laughs> what do you think of that? I think that's crazy. Um, we have enough policing already. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, of course, Al Sharpton was an FBI informant. But what he is saying is essentially, I, I would think many of us believe that it is the federalization of the police and the way the federals have uh, taught them to shoot first that is at the heart of this issue. I totally agree. Yeah. I Talk think to us about, you grew up in, in, in poor circumstances, uh, of course, in L.A., right? Not, absolutely, uh, Baltimore. Yes. So, so talk to us about uh, people's responses to this. I mean, what do you think about the looting that's going on there? Is that appropriate? If not, if, if that's not appropriate, what do we do to well, change it's things? It's definitely not appropriate. But, you know, when, when you smash somebody up, you know, and, and, and you back them in a the corner, uh, they're going to come out with the only way that they know how, you yeah. know, and some right. of these people, they're not well educated. You know, our education system is, is in, in the black community is down. You know, we don't get the best teachers. Um, I feel, I, I mean, you know, when I go out to these schools and I speak to a lot of these inner city kids, um, let me tell you this, they want to read my book. Mm hmm. But do you know the schools won't buy it for them? Really? Yeah. Something as simple as a yeah. as a book that they could get for ten, seven dollars. Well, they got their own agenda. Okay. They have their they've own got, agenda. They've got they an want. agenda. It's filled up, and they don't want you going outside of that agenda. Exactly. That they, they don't want the kids to get the information that the kids want. They, oh, this is what you get. This is where you stay. It's almost like keeping you in your place. Mm -hmm. It's like another form of slavery all over again where you got to stay in your place, and if you step out of your place, then you're on your own, and, and we're going to have our police force to deal with it. And your story is something that people should hear because just looking at the, your biography on Wikipedia in terms of some of the dollars, how big this operation was in, uh, in L.A., well, $1980, they say that you had $900 million with a, a profit of nearly $300 million. In today's dollars, it would be $2.5 billion gross of that $850 million profit. So, I mean, it sounds like you were living the life and the success, right, that absolutely. everybody is looking for. And, and right? you're talking but, about a kid mm -hmm. that they said in school was a dummy. Mm -hmm. They had me feeling as if I wasn't going to make it in, in life. Uh, I had, they, the, the system gave me low self-esteem mm -hmm. because I wasn't functioning in the way that they felt that I should be functioning. And, and that made me lash out. That made me look for ways that I could be successful. It made me go and start hanging out with, with gangsters and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. people that, that would accept me. Because if, if, if the mainstream society don't accept you, you want to be accepted by but, somebody. And so your story is something really that inner city kids ought to look at. Because here you are offered what they would all dream of, uh, the pinnacle of success. And yet it was a Faustian bargain with the devil. The Absolutely. government, Absolutely. if you will, okay? <laughs> the government, you, you didn't know it at the time, but you had made a deal with the, the devil himself. Absolutely. And after a few years of this success, it came back to bite you with a life imprisonment, okay? Imprisonment. A life so, sentence without the possibility of parole. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that, that is amazing. And then you turned your life around. What but, turned your life and around? And that's not even the, the, the most amazing part of it. After I got the life sentence, I was totally illiterate. This dumb kid that couldn't succeed in school, wind up being smarter in the courtroom than a Harvard graduate, a <laughs> Yale graduate, and the top judge. Because once I taught myself to read or write in prison, I explained to them why they couldn't give me a life sentence and why them giving me a life sentence was illegal, was against their own books, and, and, and they didn't understand that. Uh, uh, it reminds even, me of the New Jersey weed man. 
who uh, had like a pound of marijuana, and uh, he was a medical marijuana advocate. And uh, they picked him up, and because of the quantity, they were going to put him in jail for trafficking. And he said, well, you know, I don't really think I'm going to get much defense from a, a legit, you know, a regular lawyer. <laughs> so he looked at it and he said, you know, most of the people uh, d don't agree with our laws on marijuana. They think they're draconian and out of a line. So he goes, all I have to do is get one person out of 12, it's like 8%, right? right. And he knows that like 50 to 60% of the people, some cases higher, disagreed with the laws of that time about two years ago. So he defended himself and he used jury nullification. Wow. And the first judge says, you can't tell them about the law, you know, and yeah, exactly. said, take that down exactly. and hold you in contempt. But he still got seven people to vote for acquittal. They came after him a second time. That judge let him put up the, the law right out of New Jersey, okay, that showed that they have, juries have the right to judge the facts of the case, not just uh, uh, the law, rather, and not just the facts. I'll tell you, you've got to just judge the facts.